Hello and welcome to the Zapiens Podcast. I'm your host, Lloyd Waits. Today, I want to start with a little activity. So close your eyes and lift your arm about shoulder height. Now move it around a little bit in all different directions. And think about where it is that it is. Now open your eyes. And it's in the same place that you thought it was, wasn't it? But you never saw where it was. You, you weren't touching anything. It was in midair. How did you know right where your arm was? It's almost as if you have this sixth sense to know where your body parts are. And the truth is you do. It's a sense called proprioception. The human body doesn't have five senses. It has far more. And if you're trying to design artificial limbs, you have to worry about A lot more than just the senses that we think about every day. My guest today is a man named Hugh Herr, who lost his own legs in a mountain climbing accident, and then went on to make some of the most advanced bionic limbs in the world. And what he does is he takes these ideas of proprioception, of touch, and allows sensory feedback into his bionic limbs so they're no longer just some tool that you use but a part of who you are. We had a really great conversation with a really interesting guy today. I hope you enjoy it. I know I did. Thanks a lot for coming and talking with us today. Uh, we were My excited pleasure. to talk to you. Um, and uh, so we're pretty familiar with a lot of what you do with your prosthetics work, but um, for people that are seeing this for the first time, do you mind uh, just giving a brief overview of all of uh, your work and what you're working on now? Great. So uh, uh, I... I co-lead the, the K. Lisa Yang Center for Bionics with Ed Boyden. Mm-hmm. Um, and I direct, my specific group is called Biomechatronics. So we, we develop wearable robotic systems that link to the body mechanically as well as neurally that uh, move dynamically um, like their biological counterparts. So the lab deals with, you know, how do you attach a robot to the skeleton? How do you attach a robot computationally to the peripheral nervous system, to muscles and nerves? How do you build a robot that looks aesthetically beautiful, that moves and has high functionality? So these are the various uh, questions that we're answering. Okay. Uh, So what makes your prosthetics different? I mean, this kind of idea of using uh, either a Utah array or, or some kind of uh, direct interface to these prosthetics has been around for a long time. But as soon as you see one of your prosthetics, you can tell how much different they are. Can you explain kind of the science of why these are so unique? Right, so um, the work that we're doing now, um, that's the most invasive um, we no longer just describe it as a prosthesis or an artificial limb. It's, we call it bionic reconstruction. So we want to intimately connect to the body mechanically and electrically or neurally. So we're pursuing osseointegration where there's a titanium shaft that goes through the skin membrane directly into the residual bone for direct skeletal loading. Um, and the osseo implant has a channel inside where we can have 16 electrical leads going from inside the body to electrodes to outside the body into the microprocessors that um, drive the, the robotic limb. Um, and then we're, we're reconfiguring soft tissues in a way that, that affords 
um, a bi-directionality. So we can measure the intent of the human, how they wish to move, by um, looking at signals coming down from the central brain through the spinal cord, through the nerves to the end organs. We can also reflect information, sensory information from the prosthesis onto the nervous system. So a person can actually feel touch, can feel movement of the joints as natural percepts. And what, what we're exploring with this bidirectionality in the neural interfaces, we're exploring embodiment. So when we bidirectionally couple the nervous system with mechatronics, our patients say that they have their body back, that the mechatronics are actually part of their own identity and own uh, self which is really, really interesting, so that people no longer view the prosthesis as a tool, but something uh, more fundamental um, as being their limb, uh, as equivalent to flesh and bone. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic, because I've, I've heard a lot of the time um, with other groups that work in, in similar prosthetics, not as much bionics, is that a lot of people prefer not to have these very complicated systems, and that a lot of people, kind of the dirty secret of prosthetics is that a lot of people would prefer to just have a hook because it's an easier tool to use rather than having to focus all the time moving your arm. But you said you haven't encountered that because of, because of that neural feedback, do you think? So a lot of the f folks in, the, in my field are pushing the robotics and the machine learning and what I call intrinsic control. So intrinsic control, all the sensing, computation um, is local, is on the actual robot that's being worn, on the prosthetic limb in the case of amputation. There's no direct link to the brain. So we can, of course, with machine learning and great robots, at some point match biological dynamics. You know, it's just a matter of time. Um, but, you know, it, it'll never feel like to the patient that it's their limb. They'll feel like they're, they're in the back seat of this really powerful sports car. But they won't feel that the car is them and they're the car. And the car is, you know, integrated completely with their identity. You know, clinically, our goal is if a person gets cancer, for example, in their arm and it's amputated, our goal is a complete restoration of that arm, as good or better in flesh and bone. So to do that, we have to link to the nervous system because you will not get embodiment. It will not truly be yours if, it, if you can't feel, touch, think, and move. Um, sure, we can use AI, but that's after we have high fidelity nervous system signaling, we can use AI to go beyond physiological capabilities into augmentation. First and foremost, we, we need full embodiment. Are you looking at using uh, AI and ML on kind of both sides of the spectrum, of both reading and stimulating? Or is it something that's much more conducive to one side of, of communication? Um, you know, in, in, our, in our interfacing with the nervous system, we've not largely had to use um, machine learning. Um, you know, the you know, when you can understand the physics and the biophysics, you know, you don't have to use machine learning. You have very good models of what's happening. Um, so yeah, I mean, in some of our synthetic neural interfacing, how we get signals from, from nerves and muscles, there's, the computational load is very high, so we'll, you know, cloud computation is would be very helpful, um, but uh, often we understand the physics well enough to not have to use machine learning. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, I mean, obviously you have touch feedback, um, and you've talked a lot about proprioception feedback, which is, I think, super awesome because a lot of people don't even realize they have proprioception when you talk to them. Um, but what about other senses? Are you looking to expand to other senses like maybe temperature? or, um, I don't know, maybe feelings of vibration or high frequency, high frequency noise, something like that? I mean, vibration's part of cutaneous touch feedback, right? Okay. Um, temperature, I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's low on the to-do list. Okay. You know, our 
biological hands, we accidentally touch a hot stove and we're like this and we, we move away from the threat because we don't want to damage our tissues. So in a, in a prosthesis, it, it's really an economic question. If you touch a hot stove and harm your tips, I mean, if, if it's inexpensive and materials are abundant, you can just replace them, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's a different, you know, it's interesting. Part of my body is artificial, part is biological. As I age, I have your typical biological uh, decline, age-related degeneration, but the synthetic part of my body is getting better and better with time. So as we march through this 21st century, hum humanity, there'll be more and more designed constructs with, within our bodies and on our bodies. So more and more of our cells will be a reversed mortality where that actually improves with age. Um, so that's, that's very, very interesting. So talking about the artificial interfaces, um, I know a, a lot of the time people are using electrodes or kind of steel in, or metal inserts of some kind like a Utah array, but there's also a lot of development of things like optogenetics or even wetware. Um, do you have an opinion on, the, on these different types of interfaces and which ones you prefer to use or um, which ones you think will be the most promising going forward? Yeah, more of the wetware. Um, the Utah array is, is stiff. Um, it's material impedance doesn't at all you know, uh, resemble the impedances of neural tissues. And there's, there's scarring and various issues. Also, that's an invasive interface into nerve. Um, uh, so viability is, is very, uh, very difficult. Nerves don't like to be touched. It's kind of a funny statement, but it's true. And, you know, a direct interface to nerves, not only do we have to get the interface to work to be viable mm -hmm. but when it's viable we have to figure out the algorithms so for the, for to to feel something as natural as touch or proprioception how do you what what are the signals you would send into nerve where it actually feel like natural persons um, we don't know so our approach is to do afferent sensory feedback using biological mechanoreceptors. So we use the skin cells. We use the spindle and Golgi tendon organs and muscle tendon for proprioception. So we don't, uh, we go via those bio biologics. And then we're, we're, we're guaranteed to have natural sensation. You know, skin is the largest organ in the human body and arguably the most complex. Um, so it's uh, very important to go through the mechanoreceptors, in my view. It also simplifies the problem tremendously in terms of um, technological challenge and, and regulatory challenges. So for example, how do we do that? So for proprioception, we, um, we invented a surgery where when the limb's amputated, we, we link muscles into natural dynamic pairs. Um, we essentially create a biological joint in the residuum. So when a, you know, when a person with baloney amputation thinks and moves their phantom foot ankle complex, the muscles that are you know linked to the ankle or assigned to the ankle in the residuum move dynamically, and because they're moving, the the central nervous system actually feels the phantom limb ankle moving in full range of motion. And then when, a, when we attach the bionics, the person looks down and their bionic limb is moving and they feel it and they see it. <laughs> and that's when you get the full embodiment. Cutaneous, we're actually surgically taking skin cells, wrapping a patch of skin around a, a cutaneous transected nerve. The nerve regenerates attached to the skin cells. Then we wrap the whole skin cells with a muscle actuator and artificially stimulate the actuator to apply controlled strains on the skin cells. So as an example, when the robot reaches out and touches the coffee cup, that's sensed with artificial sensors, 
the computer then stimulates the muscle actuator around the appropriate skin patch for that for this and this digit, mm -hmm. and then the person actually feels the coffee cup. That's really fascinating because I've always heard of people using wetware as things with stem cells directly and never using skin cells and, and muscle actuator. That's very fascinating. Yeah, approach. so we, um, so I call this neural embodied design. So some so many people view design as oh we're gonna design some synthetic stuff and attach it to the body. They view the human body as invariant. You can't redesign the body. So we're gonna treat that as fixed and then design stuff to try to have better function. We look at both. We look at the biologics and the synthetics. How can you co-design to enhance communication between the two? So we invent surgeries. We, we're using optogenetics, uh, the protein scale, mm -hmm. the whole way up to the whole the scale of entire organs. Yeah, that was actually my next question was, uh, since we just spoke of, uh, at Boyden, um, I did want to ask about how you were using optogenetics and is that a problem with human subjects? I've heard before that there are issues in optogenetics because of the gene therapy that's involved um, and that sometimes it can be tricky to in involve optogenetics in human subjects during processes like this. Well, gene therapy is, is the dominant issue. So um, my lab um, made the discovery that uh, the when you use optogenetics in the peripheral system, so when you do a fiery delivery mechanism in a muscle and you have opsin expression in the nerve that innervates that muscle, you get opsin dynamics. So you get you first get light sensitivity after a few months, and then it plummets, and then you no longer have light sensitivity. So why does that happen? We we discovered that um, the opsins trigger an immune response within the mammal. Uh, and you have cell death and muscle atrophy and so on. So a critical next step, and we're talking to Ed Boyden about this, is how do we design an opsin that's compatible to humans that does not trigger an immune response? When we solve that problem, um, optogenetics um, has been a powerful scientific tool. When we solve that, it will also be a powerful clinical tool. Currently, optogenetics clinically is predominantly being used in, uh, um, in, a, in, in immune uh, privileged anatomy, such as the visual system. If we solve a human grade ops, and it'll be applicable to all types of um, clinical problems in all areas of the body. So, um, because there are all these different pieces that need to go into using prosthesis like this, um, or bionics like this, do you have to have a, a special kind of surgery to prepare for something like this? Or is it something that if yeah. you've had a surgery beforehand, you could then have it integrated later? No, we, we can do either. Okay. So in the case where a person doesn't have a limb amputated and requires an amputation, we can create these Amy dynamic muscle pairs. And, um, and if, with a per if a person has an amputation, has had an amputation for decades, we can do a revision and create the dynamic muscle pairs, um, which is very exciting. So I, for example, could could get the Amy constructs, and I plan to. How come you haven't done it yet? Um, I just, you know, there's a menu of options, and I'm waiting to for the technology to catch up to my desires. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I have a sense of what I'd, what I'd like um, to receive and we'll probably go under uh, the knife in, in the next few years. As, as kind of a, a fun fact, I actually met one of your, uh, your patients or someone that you're working with in a bar, Lexi, uh, oh, Lexi Bader. Yeah, great. yeah she, um, she used to date one of my longtime high school friends, Nick Silva. Um, Was that I, here or in Boulder, Colorado? Oh, um, so she was in Essex, Massachusetts, which is where I, right. I grew up, um, and uh, I ran into her at a bar, and my friend Nick, who, uh, who was with her at the time, said, oh, you, well, you're at MIT, do you know Hugh Hurt? I said, yeah, I know Hugh Hurt. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've seen his work all the time. I've been looking to meet him, and now I, now I guess to meet him. Yeah, Lexi very cool. was, was very nice. Um, yeah, she's great. Yeah, he said that you guys go rock climbing together, so it's kind of amazing that she was able to recover from such a bad snowboarding injury. 
Yeah. Yeah, she's doing really well. Yeah. Um, so, um, I also see that you're kind of going beyond uh, just bionics, but also doing things like bionic shoes and uh, trying to work with exoskeletons as well to kind of enhance people's strength. Can you tell me a little bit about those projects as well? Right, so uh, over a hundred years ago, the first publication occurred in exoskeletons. The inventor, Russian inventor, Yagen, who lived before communism, not after, before, in, under a czar of Russia. <laughs> and his vision was to augment the Russian army with this crazy exoskeleton that straps to the leg that augments walking and running. Um, since that invention, scientists and technologists have struggled to build an exoskeleton that actually augments something like walking or running or jumping. Um, actions that us humans are very good at doing. We've been doing it for a very long time. Um, and it was only until uh, it was only until 2014 that my group was able to, to develop an exoskeleton that uh, for the first time actually augments human walking. Um, since then, we've spun out a company called Defy. Um, and my co-founders in that company, Luke Mooney and Jeff Duval, um, have been working rigorously to uh, further advance leg exoskeletons. Now we have exoskeletons that you strap on. It's nearly as easy to put on as a, your own shoe. And you can walk and run and enjoy um, energetic augmentations of higher than 25%. So we're entering a new era where we're moving away from only having transportation devices that are large metal boxes with four wheels or bicycles and transportation devices that are anthropomorphic, that capture human dynamics, that are intimate with the human body. Um, so what will be the effect on, for example, architecture when our cities are filled with this new modality of transportation? Well, we won't need as many paved roads We'll have a lot more dirt and trails and flowers and throughout our cities. Um, and we'll have people walking and bouncing and jumping with these bionic systems. Um, so that's that's the vision, and the field is finally making progress. I also heard you talk about uh, power sports where people are using exoskeletons to play power football or extra high. Yeah, I, al I always say that... Um, when a leg exoskeleton exists where you can run without breathing hard and not be in shape like myself, um, but you maintain the versatility of the human legged system and nervous system, mm -hmm. the balance and whatnot, um, no one will ever use the mountain bike ever again. You know, imagine running up through the wilderness day after day with the agility of your own legs, but not having to even breathe hard. It'd be so much fun. Um, so that's what I call power running. <laughs> yeah, a whole new meaning to power walking too, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you think that's going to impact kind of long term long term sports? Because I mean, I, I play football for a long. Time. I mean, one of the greatest inventions in human history is the, in my view, the bicycle. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous invention. And it offers profound augmentation to humans. We can go so much further, so, so much faster. Um, and because of that invention, we now have this amazing sport called cycling. Right? So we're going to have power, uh, you know, climbing exoskeletons, walking exoskeletons, running, jumping exoskeletons, swimming exoskeletons. Every single one will result in a new sport. So sport, sports in the 21st century is going to completely expand and become really interesting. What's the most popular spectator sport in the United States? Football. No. no, race car driving. Oh yeah, that's right. That's a human machine sport. sport. Human machine sports are really exciting, right? <laughs> and what's interesting, the Paralympics, many dimensions of the Paralympics are human machine activities. So if, if the Paralympic Committee allows advancements in technologies to continue to be used in the Paralympics. Um, the, we'll reach a point where the Olympics is completely boring compared to the Paralympics. 
like, oh, the Olympics, oh, that's what normal boring bodies can do. <laughs> Let's go to the Paralympics where the speeds and jumping heights are much cooler. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I saw a picture of you having extended pros- or extended legs to help you with climbing. I always thought that was the coolest thing. Cause I yeah, I was like, in that photo, I, I think I'm three meters high. <laughs> <laughs> able to reach absolutely everything. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the other thing that I thought was interesting about that, when I first saw the, the video of the, the, um, the shoes, um, was that, I mean, typically when you talk about um, people putting on additional sportswear, um, I think people wearing weighted vests or ankle weights to try and make the exercise harder so that their body becomes stronger. Do you, I know there's kind of the obvious of like making these additional sports with something with exoskeletons, but do you feel like it will, it could possibly go the other way where kind of like the average person starts wearing them to work. And so they start to atrophy throughout a lot of their muscles. And they just... I don't No. Uh, I mean, that's a design issue. So we, humans haven't become, become fatter and atrophied because of the, of the bicycle. The opposite has happened. So the humans augmented and still is getting a lot of exercise. So the exoskeleton can't do absolutely everything for the human. It has to be a collaborative effort between bi- biology and mechatronics, where the human's still putting an effort, but the combination of the human body and the mechatronics um, results in an augmentation. That's the way to, to think about it. So the uh, I predict the opposite will happen. People that... Um, are couch potatoes because it hurts to walk or are couch potatoes because it hurts to run and then they hate running. These new technologies will allow walking and running and jumping to be fun and not so painful. So I think the opposite will happen. The general fitness level of society will increase because of these platforms. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I mean, a lot of people would never go on a, on a bike ride through, through the woods before with the right. bicycle. They wouldn't go for a walk. And look what happened. Bicycle. Look what happened with e-bikes. That's right. Like lots of people are getting out biking now mm-hmm. that would not be out biking if it wasn't for the electronics and the augmentation. The same will be true with bionic apparel. In addition to helping all of those people who wouldn't have been able to do it at all before because of certain either um, health issues or that they're just exactly. growing older. So another part of this that I was wondering about is why work with an exoskeleton compared to just replacing an entire limb, for example, with complete bionics? Do you think it's, in, in some ways, the, the bionic limbs that you've made in your legs are already superior to my legs, to a, to a regular person's leg? Not quite yet. Well, I mean, in that terms of client, I can't stretch three, three meters long true. with my legs. I don't have hooks. That but we need there. another about two decades for for bionic limbs to generally be equivalent to biological limbs. Okay. Um, and then we'll, beyond those two decades, there'll be lots of augmentation. So you're, I mean, you're right in the context of limb pathology. So if we live in the future, you know, 50 years from now, we're gonna be able to build arms and legs and at least replicate biological function. So if you're sitting there and you're 60 years old and you wake up and your hands are arthritic and they're hurt, it's a completely rational decision to upgrade to neurally interface, skeletally interface mechatronics and have your 18-year-old limb back. That sounds outlandish now, but if you live with pain every day, it's completely rational. Um, And that's, we're already seeing that. It's so many medical cases, um, the person's quality of life will actually improve even with today's prosthetic technology, uh, which is exciting. Now, when we get to the point where perfectly healthy limbs are being amputated, um, maybe, you know, if you ask me, what's, what's the future astronaut that'll go to Mars and beyond? So the problem with space travel and microgravity environments is radiation and also in the microgravity, um, organs don't do very well. 
So, you know, the ultimate astronaut is probably genetically modified to take radiation and probably all, all limbs are bionic uh, where microgravity, atrophy um, are a non-issue. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> what do you think are the, the kind of sticking points right now from getting us from the point we're at now to being able to compete with the larger world? Uh, I mean, the three areas is we, we need a synthetic actuator that's as good or better than skeletal muscle in terms of torque density and uh, audible noise and durability and so on. We need um, a way to attach robots to the to the skeleton in a healthy, comfortable manner. We need really high fidelity brain interfaces. Um, once we have those three interfaces, it's it's kind of game over. So the the field is um, a lot is happening, and I think in five to ten years, it's possible that a person with an arm amputation plays Beethoven on the piano at normal speeds, normal tempos. And a play person with a leg amputation can, uh, can perform ballet. You know, these are the most extreme motor tasks in humanity. So that's why I'm picking playing Beethoven on the piano and ballet. <laughs> <laughs> so I can imagine such activities being possible even within a decade. Why, I mean, in a lot of cases, I guess it makes sense to go directly with uh, something technological and, and silicon-based for, like, say, a, a leg amputation. But in other cases, like you were describing someone who has bad arthritis in their hands, do you think it would be better to try and work with some kind of metal silicon technological version of a, class, of a bionic or with something more like regenerative medicine and using stem cells to try and, or... Uh, aging therapies that are being developed now. What do you think is a... I mean, we're on a race okay. between biological reconstruction and bionic reconstruction. Right. Right. And today, like, if you do state-of-the-art regenerative medicine, surgical limb, limb rebuilding using wet techniques, mm -hmm. surgical techniques, versus bionic reconstruction, even today it's not clear. Often bionics... Is, is better even today. Yeah. I mean, you're never going to regrow your, your leg, right? Like, I'm never going to be able to walk again well, with regenerative medicine. You know, I have a so. synthetic biologist friend who says, Hugh, why are you fooling around <laughs> with mechatronics? Let's just figure out how to regrow human limbs. And I was like, that's really old-fashioned because 20 years from now, artificial actuators will be superior to skeletal muscle. So why would you ever want to grow back your limb when you can get something even better? <laughs> well, do you think that you can also genetically modify the skeletal muscle? Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think there's. But the the politics and the ethics around genetically modifying humans is challenging. Potentially. Um, I also feel like I definitely have the opinion that biology is magic a lot of the time. Coming from a physics background, I hear about these amazing things and don't realize how difficult some of these processes are. Um, so I was curious what you, you felt about that. Um, but we can switch gears into uh, kind of how you, how you got here. Um, how, how did you grow up? What, what led you down, down this path of eventually becoming a tenured MIT professor at this beautiful lab? It's miraculous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it happened, actually. Um, I grew up uh, in a family, a Mennonite family in Lancaster, County, Pennsylvania, farmland. Our neighbors were Amish, very religiously conservative. Both the Mennonite and the Amish traditions are somewhat, um, somewhat oppose rapid technological advancements. It's, it's um, shit. So it's it's really funny that I'm doing what I'm doing now. Um, <laughs> So I, I was I was I started mountain climbing uh, at seven years old, and when I was in my tweens, um, eleven and so on, uh, uh, I started to really excel in the vertical world, and 
doing climbs that most adults couldn't do. And then as an early teenager, I started to do rock walls that even adults couldn't have seen. And I was considered a child prodigy. And I started climbing walls without a rope. You know, when I was 15, I was climbing 2,000 foot walls, 2,000 feet up and 2,000 feet down without a rope in about three hours in remote areas. Um, I'm just gonna go on a roller coaster. Yeah. <laughs> when I was 17, I was in a climbing accident, suffered frostbite, and uh, after months of effort, my legs had to be amputated, biological legs below the knee. Um, since climbing was my passion, I wanted to get back on the horse. Um, I had no scientific training, but I did have training on how to cut metal and wood because uh, I had I had been in a vocational school and metal machining and whatnot. So I went into the shop and built my own legs. And to my surprise and everyone's surprised, uh, 12 months after my amputations, I was climbing at a more advanced level than I achieved with biological limbs. Um, and that experience was so inspiring. I became such a fan of technology, of innovation. This idea that through thought you could rebuild your own body and actually improve it uh, was really fun. And that, that took me from being a terrible student um, in high school um, to really focusing on mathematics and science and design and whatnot. When I graduated high school, I, I, if you asked me what's 10% of 100, I would have no idea. No one ever taught me what a percent was. And I went from there to studying quantum mechanics in two years. Wow. Just like I never left my room because I was reading 24-7. <laughs> so I, I replaced climbing with academics, uh, which is very interesting. And I... I saw parallels between climbing and academics or mathematics. You know, mathematics is about patterns, seeing patterns, and it's like climbing and seeing the sequence of my body up the wall. Mm -hmm. um, so that ultimately led me to MIT and Harvard and uh, into this glorious community that. I love it. I mean, I, I totally understand that kind of request for Einstein. Do you think that that drive that you had to go from being someone who was older, was probably not going to be able to do active sports again, to being able to surpass your ability to pull. Do you think that drive in you has been something that applies to your work now and applies to your work then as well? I mean, I view it as all as a creative process. Um, creativity is so interesting because often people view a creative person um, is creative because they were born that way. I don't, I don't believe that at all. Being creative is, is an emergent from a culture and a way of thinking. Being creative is largely emotional. Creative people believe in stuff that doesn't exist yet. It's a confidence. <laughs> um, and that's the, that's the emotional dimension. Creative people aren't afraid of trying anything. Edison did not care if someone laughed at him. He would do remarkably unusual experiments. One time he took a tube and put it to his ear, and the other end of the tube he put to the base of a pendulum. You know what the experiment was? Can I think and move the pendulum? He tried it. He tried everything. He tried it. Didn't care. So that fearlessness of creative people, that's emotional. <laughs> um, so that's good news because we can teach our children, we can teach all of society to be highly creative and innovative. How do you think you can cause yourself to be more creative? And I once had a student that got straight A's in classes at, here at MIT. But in the research environment, he didn't do very well. He was terrified of doing an experiment because he was afraid the results wouldn't support his thinking, which is counter to science. Right. That's, that's exactly <laughs> what you're looking for. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Um, so for me and highly creative people, when we get a result that's unexpected, we jump up and down with joy because we're that's we're that much closer, one step closer towards a deep understanding and moving in a direction that we want to move. So when I walk an ankle prototype and it breaks and fails, it's a happy event. Um, so it's the attitude is it's it's about exploration. It's not about success and failure. We're explorers. That's how creative people think. They're explorers and they're fearless and they're forces of nature. I had a, I had a professor say in one of my classes that um, in a lot of physics that when you get something that you don't understand, that should be one of the happiest moments that you've had. Absolutely. Because we're in search of finding more problems, not trying to solve all of the problems. Um, and I've, I've always felt strangely about that. Like I felt, I mean, I look at the standard model and I, I think like, oh, this is something I want to know. I want to know the answer. It's uh -huh. not that I, I want to find more problems. I'm kind of frustrated by this. But it makes sense that in order to be creative, in order to create more, we need to try and find these problems that we never thought of. Imagine a life where there's no unknowns. It'd be pretty terrible. It'd be awfully boring. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, because then you have, because then what about art, right? Like, you don't need to have unknowns to create art. And then. What? Art, art. is about unknowns. Do you, I, I really, I, I would feel that art is art, something. There's creativity in art, just like in science. You're creating things that don't exist in the world. Right. But if we had, I don't know, the, the perfect equation of everything, we had a theory of everything, and we were able to know whatever we wanted, then I guess, do you think you could then create art? Because I've always just felt that you could. Because now that you know everything, you have the ultimate tool, you have the ultimate paintbrush to create whatever it is that you want to create. And then you could share that with anyone else. But uh, what if every song that's possible was already expressed? I guess that's another way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, that art is just perturbations. I don't, yeah. I don't think will happen in science or in art. I think it's infinite. Yeah, because, I mean, I guess, I guess that's kind of like, question that we're far away from answering because it's well, we're very far <laughs> well i mean that's also just like is the universe finite or is it infinite is it is it very very large or is it is it uh action? i think given the dimensionality of the human brain i think knowledge gathering and understanding is infinite you don't think that it's just very very large that you could there is a certain very large but finite number of permutations that you could have Different I said, of given the capacity of the human brain, it's infinite. Okay. The capacity, the depth of the universe is much greater than the capabilities of our small brains. But, you know, what's interesting now is there's the collective brain. So what happens when the three of us in this room think about the world and then thousands of people and then millions of people and then billions of people. I once had um, lunch with um, Jeff Bezos and he shared with us why he wants to go to space. And the number one reason is, do you know this? No, I don't. He wants to dramatically expand human population. Dramatically. With our single planet, we can only have so many people. And then we have so many Einsteins, so many Picassos, very limited number of geniuses. If you increase that by a thousand fold, we're gonna have lots of Einsteins and lots of Picassos. That's why he wants to go to space, which is very interesting. I've also heard kind of a, a similar argument in reverse in that um, there is a massive number of people that could have the potential to be Einsteins that uh, aren't given the resources to attain. That's them. true as well. Yeah. So we have to work on that as well. Yeah. Um, but the, I, I think that's two ways of, of attacking the, the same point. Um, so you said earlier but before we were, were filming that you have a, that you started in the physics background. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how you started out in a physics background, how you went from 
not knowing what 10% of 100 is, to quantum mechanics, and then into, into biophysics. Yeah, I, I went, I was climbing full time and I started to get, as, as happens to many extreme athletes, I started to get injuries. And the anxiety of like, when the next injury will occur um, was something I didn't appreciate too much as a lifestyle. And I realized because of my legs and how painful they were at the time that I should probably have a profession that's about thinking and sitting and not physical labor. So I went back to school for those reasons and entered a math class um, and just loved it. Absolutely loved it. How old were you at the time? Oh was... gosh, 21-ish, something like that. So you started college later than you were. Yeah, because I just climbed full time for a few years. Uh, I was also exhausted of the danger um, that I was putting myself in and the anxiety around um, eating it, uh, dying. So I entered school again and I, lo I loved it so much that it largely replaced the, the passion I had for, for climbing, um, which was a lot of fun. And I started out in computer science and after learning three or four languages, I got bored. I just saw similar patterns and changed to physics and philosophy that was just a lot more interesting. And in parallel, I, I, I started to get a greater and greater interest in design and engineering um, in, the, in the realm of artificial limbs and bionics. So I wanted to, uh, the university I was at really didn't have engineering, so, um, so I went into physics and on the side was inventing things and patenting things. Ultimately, it led me to MIT. Uh, so, what did, did you go to graduate school, or did you go? To I went to graduate school here at MIT in mechanical engineering, okay. studying under Woody Flowers. Oh, I, I, I met Woody Flowers when I was back in high school. Yeah, uh, he's, uh, with robotics. That's exactly right. Yeah. And then I went to Harvard, and I got a PhD in biophysics, working under Thomas Thomas McMahon one of the chief architects of the field of biomechanics. And then I came back to MIT, did a postdoc in medical device. And then I went back to Harvard for a faculty position and then MIT stole me from Harvard. And I've been here ever since. Awesome. Was there something in particular in physics that stood out to you? Um, something that, or maybe that has stuck with you and kind of the way that you think about doing the work today? Oh, I just, I. I love physics. Um, I find it to be extraordinarily beautiful. Um, just how a set of, a small set of equations can describe so much is, is remarkable. But it's really a, just about how nature works. Um, it's the beauty of nature captured in mathematics. Do you think it is easier to go from uh, a physics background a more biologically focused background or the other way around? The former. Yeah. That's why it's usually biophysics and a biophysicist. <laughs> it's usually physicists applying uh, their knowledge of physical law to biological systems. It's if you, if you only have biology in your training, it's really hard to learn the physics and mathematics and it's, it's mostly the other way around. Um, what about, uh, I know we talked a little bit about art and it kind of growing up with this. Is there kind of stories in particular that influenced you? Um, like, I know with me personally, I have, a, I have a picture of Iron Man on my wall at, at my house. And I, I, um, I love that movie because it, it, like, I went on to do science and work with the DOD and that, that just had a, had a big impact on me personally in the way that I kind of wanted to follow my career. I wasn't sure if there was something similar with you. I mean, my, my heroes growing up were, were not technologists or entrepreneurs. They were great thinkers and great social leaders. So Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Newton, um, those are the, the figures that I looked up to, which is interesting. I had no the Rockefellers and the, you know, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, so I, I, these, these people that give the world fundamentally new ways of thinking uh, is, is what intrigues me. 
do I mean, do you think that these people that give the world a fundamental new way of thinking is different than someone who does it through technological means? Like, I mean, I think I feel like in some way Rockefeller did give the world a new way of thinking. It might not have been the best one or a, a very altruistic one, but it was certainly different. Yeah, I mean, a fundamentally new way of thinking that leads to te technologies that move move the needle in society. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Nuclear energy, for example, came from a, a deep set of ideas. Um, so with this kind of grand vision that you have, do you consider yourself a, a transhumanist? I know that kind of gets used as a... What is a transhumanist? Right, a lot of the time people would uh, say that's kind of a dirty word, but this idea that you can uh, make improvements to the human body, that you think you can make the human body better um, and enhance it either... That's, that's obvious, isn't yeah. it? Okay. I, I'm for humanity merging with humanity's technology if it results in a maintenance or an expansion of human rights, if it results in a maintenance or expansion of human diversity, I'm all for it. If that's not true, um, then it's just a horrendous idea. So for example, you know, if we give parents the ability to design their own future offsprings, we currently have a very narrow view of what human intelligence is and a very narrow view of what human beauty is. That would be horrific. Um, it would destroy so much human rich diversity. Or the opposite could happen. Binex could dramatically expand human morphology dynamics, how we think. And that would, that would transform our definitions of beauty and capability and intelligence and so on. Um, that's the future that, that I want. If you want a third arm, great. If you want to run around the rings of Saturn, fantastic. Uh, if, if you want to feel what I'm feeling and jack into me for empathy, wonderful. How do you propose to make sure that uh, it doesn't go towards that kind of dystopian view? We need commensurate with the ever-expanding augmentation technologies. We need to train lots of PhDs in policy and law. What is the UN mandate around human augmentation? We need to be thinking about that now. Do you so, you know, if we solve, solve depression, solve schizophrenia, what will that do for art? The Van Gogh of the future, do we fix Van Gogh? Who decides? Does Van Gogh decide? Or does this community? Does a government? Do you, um, do you have ideas for what the answers to those questions would be? Well, clearly the individual, but... But then again, um, does the individual ever know? Like, someone in a depressive episode may or may not want it to end. Right. These are very, you know, perhaps if Van Gogh was received some treatment a hundred years, if he lived at a different time, and would we still have the same art? Probably not. We, we would maybe have different art, um, but probably not the same art. So it's very, very interesting questions that we have to grapple with. Because it's, it's, it's very interesting because I have several friends and family that have suffered with depression. And a lot of the time, if you ask them if you had some kind of magic thing that would just make it go away, they will say no. Because it gives them an additional piece of perspective. Um, yeah, and when they're in their creative state, it's really a glorious experience. Well, not even just in, in a creative state, but also kind of pushing someone to be more productive. Um, and I've definitely seen that in a lot of people. In some ways, it makes yeah. some. So that's why, if we, if, if, yeah. if we provide these capabilities to the individual, yeah. and they're, the individual's clearly not coerced to take any action to have any bias, um, then I, I think we'll be fine. Yeah. You know, it, it's all very scary. But if if I imagine a world 
without pharmacological interventions. And imagine I was this fancy MIT professor and I say, I invented this thing called a pill. You ingest it and it really messes with your brain chemistry. And by the way, I'm gonna get multi-billion dollar companies to manufacture it and I'm gonna get the government to try to oversee it. You'd be like, you're crazy. But I think we can all agree that pharmacological approaches have been a net gain to society. Yes, there's abuse, but the net result is very positive. Mm -hmm. Human augmentation will, will be similar. We can get it largely right. Do you have a, uh, a kind of metric that you would want to use for what you would say is objectively good or uh, objectively dystopian? Um, again, um, what I said about human diversity and individual freedoms, uh, that has to be maintained, um, which is hard, you know, largely we don't own our own data today. Uh, we already have undergraduates at esteemed institutions taking cognitive enhancement drugs and other students not taking the drugs, and is that fair? Um, so we're already seeing elements of what's coming. So we, we have to, we cannot predict any of us the many nuances of, of this new world we're entering. And we have to, we have to understand um, what we hold dear and our principles and policy is an adaptive construct. We have to continue to think and adapt and create cultures and policies and laws about uh, around what's coming so we have a generally a healthy society. I know one of the hardest pieces with me is sometimes I don't even know what I would want to picture. Kind of like what you're saying. It does have to continuously adapt because... Well, I mean, we now live in a world where people suffer tremendously because of uh, conditions that are not yet um, treatable or treated effectively. So the experience of disability is, is everywhere in the world. And we can't even comprehend a world without disability, without disease. And we view as that, oh, bad luck, or we were born with, with this, and that's that. Imagine a world where we had control over our bodies. Um, it's, it's a human rights issue. Today we can live a world where you have a person with seeing impairment or with paralysis, and they want to see and they want to dance, but they're not able to. In the future, we will be able to provide those human rights. If a person doesn't want to move, that's fine, but they'll have the option to do so through technological interventions. So that's what's really exciting about the 21st century. We live in a world now with just profound human suffering, and we have a chance to dramatically mitigate such pain. So I know that you've also talked about a bunch of different um, ways to kind of expand the human experience in addition to in using kind of the similar tools that you've described to alleviate pain, doing things like uh, perhaps increasing human perception. Um, are those projects that you're uh, also excited about um, that you think is something that can help humanity in, in other ways that might not be easily foreseeable? Sure, I mentioned empathy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're in an empath empathy crisis in today's society, I think. So the, the ability for me to actually experience and feel what you experience and feel, to have a, a deep understanding of your perspective um, may be provided by future technologies and may be very powerful for therapeutics. Imagine a counseling in a couple where the couples could actually feel and experience the perspective of, of their partner, how healing that would be and how oh, when I say that, you're feeling this because of this experience, and oh, like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know the pain that you were feeling when I said that. 
I'll stop doing it. You know, that level of deep understanding may come from future interfaces to the brain. I mean, I'm also a little worried that it could be bad. Like, oh, you really thought that I looked that bad in that dress? Why didn't you say anything? Every, te <laughs> every technology has um, negative consequences <laughs> that we have to consider. That's why such a tool would be ha have to be used in a therapeutic setting with trained professionals. How would you propose to do technology like that, interfacing such kind of high bandwidth information between two organic inputs? Well, we, we now, just with cameras and AI, we, we're, we're pretty good now at just looking at expressions mm -hmm. to map expressions to social emotional states. Um, as good as our own brains, which is remarkable. So the, the hard part is, you know, if you say, Hugh, you're really stupid and I get sad, the hard part is for you to feel sadness in the same way I'm feeling sadness. So that's, you know, that's uh, understanding the brain and having engineering tools to target individual cells with high specificity. Um, we're not there yet by any means, but we, we will be in 70 years. <laughs> what kind of tools do you think are, are going to be doing that? I mean, we have very I mean, primitive like TMS right now. I mean, optogenetics is an example of a mm -hmm. tool that has high specificity. You can target its cell type. There's potentially tens of thousands of distinct cell types in the human brain um, that do different things, talk to their neighbors in different ways, but we need... We need interfaces with such extraordinary specificity. And we need deep understanding of how our brains work. Um, all is being aggressively worked on. So I guess what do you, I, you mentioned that we were in an empathy crisis. What do you think is probably one of the biggest problems facing humanity today? Hmm. You know, that's one of, one of the major issues, and of course environmental. We have a political problem that relates to money and politics and the degradation of principles of journalism. Um, news becoming entertainment and no longer fairly unbiased dissertations. Um, many, many issues that we face today. Um, and uh Kind of as a in closing, um, what would you want to change if you had an infinite amount of funding to be able to work on these projects or other projects or, or projects with humanity? Uh, I mean, developing the basic science and technology to to end disability in the world mm -hmm. would be a start. Um, would also love to work on the environmental problem if I had infinite funds. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that's probably of greatest urgency to humanity. Yeah, well, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is, this is great. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming over. Yeah.